Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension and Cooperative Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night. 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Hilary Shager. She's the Associate Director here on campus of the Institute for Research on Poverty. She was born in San Antonio, Texas, and then moved up to Wisconsin and went to high school at Mosinee. Came here to UW-Madison to study secondary education uh, with emphases in English and psychology. And she got her master's in public affairs at the La Follette School and got her PhD in public policy at the La Follette School. And what is the difference between a public affair and a public policy? Academic nomenclature. People wanting to name things their own thing. <laughs> no difference. <laughs> you know, there's a lot more opportunities to explain. <laughs> Then she was at the La Follette School for many years, and then in March of 2018, uh, went over to the Institute for Research on Poverty, where she is the Associate Director of the Institute for Research uh, on Poverty, is in the College of Letters and Science here at UW-Madison. Tonight, she's going to talk with us about reducing poverty by researcher, practitioner, and community partnerships. Please join me in welcoming Hilary Shaker to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Thank you so much, Tom, and thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. I'm so thrilled to be here and to talk with you about the Institute for Research on Poverty. And I just want to talk about uh, my title for a minute. So we're so excited about all the resources that the university brings to bear, but when we're talking about poverty, this is not an Ivy Tower-only endeavor. So I'm going to talk about what we do at IRP, um, but how we work with the community, how we work with researchers, how we work with practitioners and policymakers and the public uh, to try to make a difference. So just to start right in, what is the Institute for Research on Poverty? So this is a picture. We're located in the Social Science Building on campus. We were established in 1966 as part of the War on Poverty, and I'll talk a little bit about the history there. We function as an independent and multidisciplinary center. We're located, as Tom said, in the College of Letters and Science at UW-Madison. We don't grant degrees. We're a, a, an interdisciplinary research unit, but we do have opportunities for students and training, which I'll talk about as well. Our core infrastructure funding is primarily through uh, UW-Madison, but also the US Department of Health and Human Services. I'll talk a little bit about we are the only federally funded uh, poverty research center in the country at the moment. And we have a cooperative agreement with uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. And we also administer about $29 million in research projects, and that's funding from foundations, from state and federal agencies, and different local organizations. So just to give you a little bit of history about how IRP, I'll, I'll, so I'll call us IRP from now on, was created. So UW-Madison has a very long history going way, way back um, into the early 1900s of having expertise in the, what was then the new field of social science. So there was a group of economists uh, that were part of something called the Wisconsin School. And they did a lot of applied work, which was somewhat controversial. There was concern, like, how could you not just do pure academic work? Why would you want to work on real world problems? Um, but here, um, economists at UW worked on things like and helped develop workers' comp, uh, unemployment compensation, the state income tax. They worked on Roosevelt's Committee on Economic Security, Social Security, the National Labor Re Relations Act. Uh, so these were some of the early pioneers like Edwin Witte um, and, and those types of folks. And then Robert Lampman, so he was really the first uh, director and um, founder of IRP. Um, that's a picture of him there. This is when basically the Council of Economic Advisors under Kennedy and then later under Johnson said, we want to wage a war on poverty. How do we do that? And somebody there told them, well, you need RAND. You need a RAND for poverty. You need a group of people who can tell you what works and who aren't going to be embedded in sort of the, the political machine and structure, who can really try to go at it um, from that more objective research 
um, sort of framework. So IRP was established as an independent research center uh, to try to do some program evaluation and see the impact of policies over time. Again, this was somewhat controversial at the time because it was looked at as not academic, um, you know, that this was more applied research. But as we know, at UW, we have something called the Wisconsin Idea, where what we do here is for the good of of the world. Um, and so it was embraced here at UW and we've been around ever since. So how do we realize the Wisconsin idea? I just want to talk a little bit about our mission. It's multi-pronged. So we are a research institute and that is first and foremost what we do. But also to really make this work and make an impact, we have uh, parts of our work that involves training scholars, uh, that we engage actively with policymakers and practitioners, and we're also very interested in making sure that our research and our work is disseminated widely. Um, and again, our vision or the goal that we're working toward is that we try to have policies and practice that in, are informed by evidence and lead to the reduction of poverty and inequality in the U.S. And so how do we do this? What, you know, what do we actually do day to day at IRP? Um, so we're explicitly trying to connect all these pieces, the research, the training, the policy, and the practice. So we have about 25 staff, anywhere from 25 to 30, depending on how many projects we're working on at one time. And we have about 200 affiliates. Uh, so those are scholars and practitioners, about 100 on campus and 100 throughout the country. Uh, and we work with them and support them. As I said, we oversee over $20 million of research grants annually. Uh, we have very close relationships with policymakers and practitioners, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more. And then another piece of our work is trying to train and support a diverse and multidisciplinary core of poverty researchers. So like I said, this is not an ivory tower only endeavor. So we have a logic of collaboration. Uh, we can't do this without the help of local, state, federal agencies and other partners. Um, they help us understand what policy issues are important. Uh, they talk to us about innovative programs. They share their experience that we need to learn from and we need to see on the ground how things are working. Uh, they provide us with data to do research and they sometimes provide us with funding. And then what we bring to bear, again, is our wonderful core of researchers and staff, our technical expertise. We have sort of the long-term horizon that maybe legislators can't enjoy who have to vote the next, the next day. Um, and we also provide funding for uh, different aspects of the work. So this is our current leadership. Just really quickly, I want to give a shout out to our fantastic director, Lonnie Berger, who is a social work professor. So the institute is run by a faculty member that's a rotating position. Um, and then uh, myself and Becca uh, Schwai, uh, we are staff positions. So we're there. Jeff, uh, another associate director who run, runs the Graduate Research Fellows Program. And this, um, not for you to see every name, but what I just want to point out in terms of our executive committee is that it's very multidisciplinary. So you'll see faculty there from social work, from economics, um, from the School of Human Ecology, uh, sociology, public affairs. Um, so we are very intent law um, on making sure that we have that interdisciplinary perspective because a problem like poverty, um, that you can't come at it from just one angle. And our org chart, again, uh, not so interesting to look at all the little boxes, but just to let you know the type of people and, and positions that we have at IRP. Um, so we have a group of people that are working on dissemination, who are editors or doing podcasts, different things like that. We have a set of researchers. Um, we have different uh, students who are working for us um, and all kinds of folks working together. Uh, data programmers who run our administrative data core and again, very interdisciplinary kind of place with a lot of exciting mix of skills. Another thing is that we are uh, the leader of something called the US Collaborative of Poverty Centers, or the CPC, and this is fairly new. But this is a collaborative of nine poverty centers throughout the country. Yeah, you can see the, the different schools that are represented there. And um, we work together to try to set a research agenda, to support each other in different programming, to come together to do publications, different kinds of things like that. 
And we also um, have put together a series of thematic networks. So these are thematic research networks that focus on issues like poverty and geography, family functioning, employment self-sufficiency, transition to adulthood and tax policy. So again, this is trying to have this sort of national impact um, and learn from each other and give each other opportunities for training, funding, and enriching research. So moving into a little bit about how we uh, work with the federal government and our role as the National Poverty Research Center. As I said, we're the only federally funded research center in the country. Right now we're in the middle of a five-year cooperative agreement uh, with ASPE, uh, the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the Department of Health and Human Services. So we've had this role in the past. Um, sometimes it's been, uh, sometimes they fund several regional centers. So we've been one of five centers that were funded. Sometimes it's only one, but uh, the last grant uh, that was put out uh, was for one and, and uh, we currently hold it. And the overall goal there, again, is you know, again to increase the effectiveness of our research by coming together to working directly with the federal government to identify you know, what are some of the things they want to know about. We help them. Here are some of the things we think you should know about. Um, and working uh, to, to, to um, both work with them directly on some requests and then also to um, support our role as a leader in the country doing poverty research. And again, there are these three areas that we do work in, so research, dissemination, and then training and mentoring. So I'm going to go through a little bit of each, uh, just highlight a few things that we do in each of those areas. Um, so some of our research activities, like I said, some of these are, you know, we might get some questions about, um, you know, what, what can you tell us about uh, numbers regarding the opioid crisis? Can you do some lit reviews on that kind of thing? So we have some, you know, quarterly memos, different things that we do directly. Um, we have topics that we say, hey, we have some great experts here. Um, we'd love to come and talk with you about this topic. So we might, we spend a lot of time in D.C. Um, working with that. We have several grant competitions that we support, and that is um, trying to help scholars throughout the country. Some of them are targeted at more senior scholars, some at more junior scholars. Um, and then we have other research activities, workshops that we do, um, and different uh, kinds of policy volumes that we put together. Um, so just a lot going on um, all the time. And then we also do complementary research activities. So these are things that are not directly funded by ASPE, though it's, we're, it's research that our affiliates are doing um, that's being administered through the center, but certainly is supported by our role and our leadership, our leadership role throughout the country. So one I want to talk about is something called Baby's First Years. And this is a really, really exciting research project. Uh, the person uh, Professor Catherine Magnuson is the IRP affiliate who's associated with this project, but there are several scholars throughout the country who are. And essentially, this is a randomized controlled trial that will be really one of the first studies to explore whether income level actually has a causative effect on brain development. So you may think, well, don't we know that poverty is bad for children? Well, yeah, we think that's the case, right? Um, but we don't have a lot of empirical research that says directly that just income has a causal effect on how the brain develops um, going from birth. So the, what they're doing is they have a randomized controlled trial. They have a, a treatment group um, of mothers uh, who are you know, under the federal poverty line. They're going to be receiving a card um, that has $333 per month on it that they get to spend however they want. There's no rules about the spending. It's just a card. Um, and then that'll be compared to a treatment group that gets, I can't remember if it's 10 or, or $20. Um, and so essentially about $4,000 a year that what the treatment group will be getting. Um, and we'll see, is there a difference? Uh, there's going to be brain imaging. Um, they'll be doing different kinds of surveys, uh, different kinds of uh, uh, different tests. Some, there will be a qualitative component where they go and talk to families. Um, so this has been in the making for about six years, and we're really excited. It's just starting, so I don't have any results for you yet. Um, but uh, certainly the hypothesis is that um, income, having more income would be helpful. Um, another uh, really exciting program that we have is uh, brand new and funded by the JPB Foundation. 
And this is trying to build, it has a, a terrible long name, <laughs> but uh, 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 the, the important piece of it is that we have res researcher practitioner partnerships. So this again is really trying to produce policy relevant and policy important research. Um, so trying to work with people who are collecting data, who have data, but don't organizations that don't necessarily have the capacity to use it. Um, and so this is trying to provide some academic supports behind that. So the first two projects that we funded, um, one is actually in Wisconsin, in Milwaukee, called Does the Labor Market Give Credit for Learning Online? There's been an incredible increase in the use of online learning in high schools in Milwaukee. And uh, there's a question as to whether, uh, does that really translate to good learning? Um, so it seems that um, there are more credits, because students are getting more credits. They may be graduating, but are they learning things that are going to be useful to them in, for example, the labor market and long-term outcomes? Hasn't really been tested yet. And there's concern because um, these kinds of courses are particularly uh, taken by students of color. And you know, is this helping reduce the achievement gap, or could it be exacerbating the, the achievement gap? So that's one. Another, so that's a, a partnership between researchers and the Milwaukee School District. And then leveraging administrative data to increase take up of SNAP and the earned income tax credit. Um, so that is actually an experiment. Uh, it's actually two uh, different studies in California. Um, one where they're using some behavioral economics, so things, maybe you've heard the word nudge, you know, where they, can we do little low cost things um, to help people sign up for that earned income tax credit and get that earned income tax credit, um, which research shows seems to be very helpful to families. Um, and then with SNAP, um, one of the issues that we have studied in a lot of different public programs is um, how do people, so if people are eligible for a program, how do they actually take it up? Are, is there administrative burden that makes it difficult? Is there a lot of churning kind of on and off um, of the benefits and how does that impact families? Um, so the, the SNAP eligibility study looks at uh, counties that in California that have made it easier um, to stay on SNAP um, in terms of not having to do as much paperwork or giving a, a certain time limit or something like that, um, that they're rolling out gradually. So it kind of creates this um, incredible opportunity for researchers to look at counties that are doing that versus counties that aren't. Um, so those are a few examples of, of some of the exciting research that we're doing right now. Um, another thing that we do at times is um, our faculty are asked to put together uh, things like collections um, or special editions of journals. Um, so this was a very recent uh, uh, journal put together, uh, two volumes of a journal actually, um, looking at anti-poverty policy innovations for the US. So if you want to read sort of what do we think works, what does the research say, um, on how we do this across a lot of different policy areas. Uh, here's your bedtime reading uh, for the next few, few weeks. Okay. Um, dissemination. So this is great if you do all this really high quality research, but if nobody knows about it, um, not so helpful. <laughs> so we put forth a lot of effort to try to make sure um, that the research is getting into the hands of the people that can actually take action, right, and do something with it. And I want to say something really important about dissemination, though. It's not just handing a report to a policymaker. It's really about translating the research, talking to the policymaker, and listening <coughs> to the policymaker about what is it that I can do with this, or here's what I need, here's the question I still have that I need you to go answer. Here's what's going to happen when I hand this to the people on the street. So I, start, I started my career as actually a, a middle school and high school teacher. And when I went back to policy school and started you know, hearing about all these great experiments, I was like, have you ever been a teacher? You, you know, have, have you spent time a, a day in a classroom and thinking about how this works? So IRP is really full of people who do think about that, do care about that a lot, and that's why the, the research really works. So these are some of the dissemination activities um, that we do. 
Uh, we really do try to bring researchers and practitioners together whenever we can because, again, we learn a lot of important things as an institute from practitioners and policymakers. In addition to, we think we have a lot of helpful information that you know, could definitely improve uh, and inform policies as well. So um, I know you can't see all the pictures, but I wanted to take the opportunity that if you didn't know, I wanted to invite you to our weekly seminar that we have on Thursday afternoons. This is in the Social Science Building, uh, so we have different speakers every week on any variety of topics. Some are from UW, some are from different places across the country, um, so please check that out. Uh, we also have something called the Lampman Lecture after our founder uh, once a year this year. Um, it's uh, uh, Bruce Western who's going to be talking about uh, uh, corrections policy, and then we have a new perspective lecture perspectives lecture where we try to really highlight some cutting edge research or research that um, you know, we haven't thought about as connected to poverty before. Um, and this year we're looking at sort of how our on the ground nonprofits and organizations using information to inform their practice and try to reduce policy or poverty. So this is just a look at some of the different resources that uh, we put out from the Institute. So we have several publications. We have Focus and Fast Focus. So those are uh, quarterly and uh, monthly publications that highlight a topic of interest. Uh, we have uh, the wonderful Dave Chancellor puts together podcasts for us. Um, here I've highlighted one where we talked to some folks at the Department of Public Instruction and uh, some professors at UW talking about their partnership. We have a frequently asked questions section where we try to provide information to a lot of the questions that we get. Um, and again, I encourage you to check out our resources page and uh, take a look. So the third arm of our work, again, is training and mentoring. And um, also, increasingly, we're really trying to work on the diversity of uh, our Poverty Scholar Corps. So we have a lot of efforts. Uh, and diversity means a lot of things. So racial and ethnic diversity, um, diversity in age, diversity in region, diversity in methodology, diversity in um, all sorts of things. So um, we do have training opportunities for anywhere from undergraduate students to grad students and faculty. And um, something that I really enjoyed earlier this fall is we um, worked with our, uh, we have quite a few opportunities on this campus, people who are working on mentoring. Uh, so we did a great mentoring workshop for faculty. Um, we have a National Poverty Fellows Program, which uh, works with the federal government, where we have um, folks, uh, young scholars who maybe uh, are still trying to decide, do I want to go into academia or am I more interested in government or something else, um, spending some time at a federal agency and doing research and evaluation there um, for a few years before they make that decision. So lots of different opportunities. Um, our Graduate Research Fellows Program also that supports UW grad students. Um, it's a wonderful program. I'm a, a graduate of myself um, that brings together interdisciplinary. So you can be from the School of Education, Human Ecology, Engineering, Economics. Um, it's just a great discussion and way for students to, to learn from each other. And this is an example of something that um, is supported by our federal grant that we're really excited about. So we've done for two years now. Um, it's a dissertation proposal workshop for underrepresented students. Uh, we work with Howard University in Washington, D.C. Um, and so uh, the first round, I think we had 12 or 14 scholars. And it was the next year, we got like 95 applicants. <laughs> um, so we upped it to about, I think there were 21. Um, it's been a really popular program, a great opportunity uh, for us and for them. Uh, again, complementary training activities, so this is not funded by our federal grant, but funded by uh, JPB, is an Emerging Scholars Fellowship. So we have our first three uh, this, uh, this year, uh, Stephanie Canizales, Jacob Faber, and Jamila Michner, um, and we're really excited. Essentially, uh, this fellowship says, here is $20,000 for professional development. 
and it's not tied to a particular research project. It's what do you need uh, to get somewhere in your career, and that's not a common um, opportunity for a young scholar. Uh, we also pair the scholar with a mentor. So this may be somebody at UW. Actually, actually I think most of our mentors are um, from our partner uh, poverty centers. Uh, but again, this is helping, these are scholars who are interested in doing applied kind of work, doing poverty research, even if it's not the cool thing to do in your sociology department, um, and you may not have peers at your university. So we're lucky here at UW. We do applied research, we have great interdisciplinary um, opportunities, the walls are really low between colleges and schools, but that's not the case for a lot of scholars across the country, so this is a wonderful opportunity. And on the other end, at the undergraduate level, a new program that we've just become involved with is the Shepherd Higher Education Consortium on Poverty. And this is trying to give undergrads an opportunity to learn about poverty by taking courses throughout the campus and then having a really high quality internship experience in the summer. So we're just starting with our first cohort this year and I'm really excited to see what happens. Okay. Um, so the, the next thing I want to talk about is the work that the Institute does with Wisconsin State Agency specifically. So we have a very long history of about 30 years of working with state agencies like the Department of Children and Families, which is another place that I worked before I came to the university. So again, that's a, it's a great opportunity and, and shows an investment in IRP and sort of um, hiring people and working with people who have, have worked in agencies, which is great. Um, but we have a philosophy, and the philosophy is uh, when we work together, it's yours, mine, and ours. So there's some, there are some questions, there are some things that we do that are yours. You just ask us to do it. You don't have the capacity to do it. Um, we can help you do it, and because we're good partners, we will do that. Some of these things are mine. I'm an academic. I have a question that um, I theoretically have, maybe it's about theory, I'm gonna publish it in a journal. Um, you're probably not gonna be super, super interested in it, um, but this is important to me and we're good partners, so we do it. A lot of our work is ours. So these are the kinds of questions that are policy relevant, that are, are gonna be both interesting to academics and have implications for theory and generalization and other programs, but they also have really direct um, and interesting implications for the department or the agency and people you're working with. So we mostly work in that hours circle, but we also have these other two circles, and that's what makes the relationship work. So we do a lot of uh, working with agencies to set a shared research agenda. We provide technical assistance and have research contracts. Again, we, sometimes we partner in seeking federal money. Uh, we have learning exchanges, so this is one of my favorite things to do, is uh, to go to the agencies quarterly and we share research and we get feedback on, oh yeah, yeah, that's not actually how it works, or you know, use, you use that data wrong or something like that. So that's actually really helpful, or we can really use this. Um, outreach to local and state governments, and then you know, we act as advisors um, when we're asked on different kinds of committees and boards. And then another really important thing, and this is um, you know, such an enriching opportunity that we have in Wisconsin that's really unique, uh, is that we have this incredible linked administrative data system. So we have something called the Wisconsin Administrative Data Core. Again, something that's been built over um, you know, building trusting relationships between the university and the state agencies where they um, have shared uh, their data, of course, in a, a way that's safe and de-identified and, and um, uh, letting, helping us come up with some shared research questions that are, going, again, going to be policy relevant. Um, but we have linked data from, uh, you know, very siloed uh, data systems, so child welfare, um, child support, uh, Department of Corrections, TANF and welfare and Medicaid, um, wage records from unemployment insurance. So we have programmers who have figured out a way um, to match all that data and do it longitudinally so that researchers can do some really uh, great policy relevant studies. So we have, we think, um, at Wisconsin, one of the richest 
um, data collections in the country uh, to be able to do this. And again, this is something that um, has, has been built through that partnership, um, and we really relish that opportunity. So some other examples um, of the research that we do with that linked administrative data core and with these partnerships that we've built with agencies, uh, child support is one of the major areas where we've done work for a long time. Uh, so we've done some studies that suggest, for example, if you, uh, so a lot of times families uh, who are poor uh, may, for example, when they owe child support, are also basically billed, say, for a Medicaid birth. And they owe money not only to the family, to their child, um, but also back payment to the state. Well, it turns out that um, when they fall behind or, or are in arrears, um, that if you pass through, if you forgive that money to the state, they're more likely to actually give money to the family. Um, so that's, that's an example um, where that's had implications, that research has had implications throughout the country. A lot of states have changed their policies around that. Um, Families Forward was a project uh, that I worked on when I was a graduate student, um, and that was looking at, again, for non-custodial parents who have fallen way behind in child support. Um, again, perhaps through barriers to employment, um, or for whatever reason, um, how do we get them paying again? How do we get them involved with their families again? Um, and this was an opportunity to look at, you know, what if we forgave some of that state debt? Or what if even custodial parents were willing to forgive some debt? Um, if they agreed to that, um, like for every dollar paid, can we forgive 50 cents of debt? Um, so that's another opportunity. And that did show positive results. That, that did bring people back into the system. Um, I've also looked at um, things like interactions between child support and child welfare. So same kind of thing, that if a, a child is placed in foster care, the non-custodial uh, parent may be paying um, for, that, for, for those state costs. And it turns out that that's actually not good for kids. It takes longer for kids to be reunited um, with their families, if that's the case. So interaction between two policy areas you didn't even really think about. So how do we, how do we think about that? <coughs> and the last bullet point here, the child support non-custodial parent employment demonstration, um, that is a randomized controlled trial. Um, it's been in uh, eight states. It's been going on for, oh, I think we're in our sixth year now. Um, but that's looking at, again, for parents who are having trouble paying child support, what if we sort of change the focus of the child support office into um, helping with employment, helping with parenting, um, and really taking uh, you know, kind of a client-centered focus on child support as opposed to just a collections or um, a, you know, sort of a, a, a more criminal justice kind of focus on it. Um, and so that's being studied right now, is what if we you know, really uh, change the culture of an organization like that does that help to bring forth more child support, better employment outcomes, and better outcomes for families? Another thing that we collaborate on is something called the Wisconsin Poverty Report. So Professor Tim Sneeding from IRP is the lead author on this, has been for many years. And this puts forth, so the official poverty measure, right, is, is something that's kind of old, um, and it's you know, got a very specific definition. Um, and this is trying to come up with a poverty measure that really takes um, a little bit more into account um, and tries to give us better answers about how policies are impacting the poverty rates in, in different counties in Wisconsin. Um, so the latest report uh, found stalled progress. So basically, poverty been, has been going down over, over the last few years, but this year was slightly up. And by this year, I should say the 2018 publication, but this is 2016 data. There's always a lag um, in how clean the data is, right? Um, so there was kind of a stall there, and, it, and it's a question of you know, why, why is this happening if we have sort of a booming economy? Um, and you know what can we do about it? So there's you know one hypothesis as well. Um, yes, um, unemployment is down, but wages aren't 
up as maybe as high as we would expect given the tight labor market. Um, another is that you know maybe um, unemployment is uh, you know is low, but there's still a group of potential workers that are not able to access um, this this good labor market. So what do we do? Uh, specifically for that group. So putting forth questions like that and working with, with Wisconsin policymakers about that. This last year, Tim also did a supplement where he was looking specifically um, about race and ethnic uh, disparities in poverty. And um, in Milwaukee, finds much higher rates of poverty for blacks and Hispanics. OK, now I want to talk about um, a project, a really exciting project that I'm working on that's really kind of a new direction for the Institute for Research on Poverty. So we were approached, uh, kind of a cold call <laughs> to UW from an organization called Schmidt Futures. And um, Schmidt Futures identifies itself as a venture facility for public benefit. Not a foundation, but don't ask me exactly what that means. Um, I'm just using their language because uh, I have permission to. And it's uh, headed by Eric Schmidt, who you may recognize as the former CEO of Google. They've done a lot of work um, in, uh, with science fellowships and, and technology funding. And now they're getting into the kind of philanthropy where they're looking at um, economic prosperity. So we were very excited. Um, Basically, Eric Schmidt, uh, or someone from his organization, uh, called the chancellor and said, we're thinking about putting together this challenge called the Alliance for the American Dream. And we want to increase the income of folks in the middle class. Um, and uh, you know, we're, do you think UW can help with that? Do you think they can do that? And uh, Chancellor Blank said, I know just the folks for you. Um, I know people who can do applied policy research and get out there in the community, and brought it to the Institute for Research on Poverty. And we were really uh, proud and excited to be one of the four inaugural partners. You can see the other three there. So to tell you a little bit about, we have rebranded our own local version of this challenge as an, an opportunity called Dream Up Wisconsin. And the specific challenge we were given by Schmidt Futures is how do we raise the income of 10,000 middle class Dane County families by 10% by the year 2020. So it is an audacious uh, challenge. Uh, and I just want to play a, a quick video for you to show you how we're approaching it. has beautiful landscapes, vibrant communities, a strong economy, and a thriving labor market. But many families find themselves strapped and struggling to make ends meet. Increases in the cost of housing, child care, and education stretch family budgets, while wages for some seem stuck. These struggles are especially prominent for people of color, who have unemployment rates that are often double, and median household incomes that are substantially lower than those of white people in Dane County. Opportunities also vary by education level and geography, leaving too many people in our county out of the middle class. But think of how much stronger our community would be if we could expand Dane County's middle class. Dream Up Wisconsin aims to do this by building on current efforts, combining university and community partners, and using funding from Schmidt Futures to find ways to boost the incomes of 10,000 Dane County families by 10%, or around $4,000. That's $40 million a year that we're going to see ripple through our economy. That's spending in local businesses. That's people saving, people investing. What does it mean to be middle class, and what can we do in this project to expand the number of middle class families here in Dane County are, are just fascinating questions and deeply, deeply important for our community. We are excited to learn from you about what the ideas are that'll help the middle class here and elsewhere. The strategies used here in Dane County 
are scalable, as scalable particularly if they're tied to industry partnerships. And we're excited to support those ideas and, and hopefully give them access to the market and the capital that they need to thrive. I hope there is a more cohesive, collaborative community vision for who we want to be and how we're going to get there. We're really trying to start by listening to the community. We're going to listen. Uh, we're going to work with uh, faith-based organizations, with local businesses, with policymakers, with, with teachers, with unions, with, with everybody in the county who's worried about the issues of the middle class. The community already has a lot of answers and systems in place about how to make things work. Now I think our role as a, as a whole uh, city is to make sure that those voices are heard and those solutions are amplified. That's, that's the sort of the miracle of the middle class is that they can become the engine that really drives growth in our community. So I think to be able to pull this together quickly and then go is going to feel very different in Dane County. Uh, but I'm personally very excited about that. I think we'll get some new energy. I think we'll get some great ideas. This is a community with one of the longest histories of research into what interventions actually work when it comes to building a strong middle class and supporting distressed communities. When the goal is finding better ways to stabilize and expand the middle class, the stakes are particularly high. I think that the energy is here in this community, the will is here in this community, the smarts are in this community, and to get people together in new and innovative ways to think differently and to learn quicker and to try things faster, that's going to be what really gets us from here to there, and that's what we need. We want you to get involved. Come to a community forum, submit your ideas, join a team. We will help build at least 10 teams from members of the community and campus around the strongest ideas. One of these ideas will receive additional funding from Schmidt Futures in 2019. To learn more and share your ideas, visit our website. Sorry, I got a little bit cut off there on the edges, but I'll try, try to fill you in. Um, so there's the audacious challenge. Um, I should say part of what was cut off, which um, breaks my heart just a little bit, <laughs> was the timeline, the audacious timeline. So we actually received the funding at the end of April, kicked it off in May. Uh, we had to narrow it down to three ideas uh, by this week. Uh, that we have three full proposals that are into Schmidt Futures that are going to be pitching their ideas in Arizona at the end of this month. So it was um, really a challenge and uh, to, to get things together that fast. And I can tell you that this is not how academia works um, <laughs> usually. Any of you uh, who are involved or have been or have friends who are. Um, so it has put us outside our comfort zone, but it's been a really, really great thing. So what we're looking for, uh, the strongest solutions that uh, Schmidt Futures was looking for, um, is to include some, uh, and I should say this is a combination. Schmidt Futures put out and said, okay, you know, we want ideas that are going to benefit, uh, come from and benefit a diverse set of people, that they're interdisciplinary and multi-sector, that they're evidence-based, that they use technology. Um, but we also absolute re absolutely required that it be a university community partnership. So we have no teams and no proposals that are just from faculty or just from the community, that that was part of what we were going to build here is that partnership. And the other thing is that we wanted to make sure that we are dealing with proposals and ideas that are going to be responsive specifically to the needs in Dane County. So what does that mean? The first thing we did is uh, we went and put together a fact sheet and tried to learn more about the population of Dane County. And what we noticed right away is that Dane County, if you look at all our averages, we look great. We are a prosperous county. Um, but I don't know if anything jumps out at you here, uh, but definitely what jumped out to us and was highlighted in the video is that there are some really, really troubling uh, disparities when it comes to income, when it comes to educational outcomes, employment, um, disparities by race in this county. Uh, so we know from other community organizations, the Race to Equity Report, um, you know, this is a problem here. So we needed to attach our challenge 
and our way to address the challenge to make sure that we were thinking about this um, as well. And so one of the first things that people in the community when we first started talking about this were like, well, you can't say middle class and expect communities of color to be excited about this because you're leaving out a lot of people if you say that. If you're defining middle class as like $50,000 a year, um, that's not even the median income for some of these populations, right? So we started talking about um, there's a missing middle class in Dane County. There's an emerging middle class in Dane County. Um, that there are people, there's a fragile middle class in Dane County. People are doing just fine today. They have a house, a job, and a car, but car breaks down. Um, I get laid off. Um, I have a medical incident, and suddenly um, you go from you know, pretty stable to being potentially in a very dire spiraling situation. So we tended to focus, um, Schmidt Futures did not say you have to choose a particular income point. Some other schools did it that way. Some other schools decided that um, they were going to use different catchment areas. Some other <coughs> schools decided we're going to have faculty-led groups. Um, but we really felt it was important that we pay attention to what the data were telling us um, and that we pay attention to the community and make sure that ideas were community-led. So the other thing that we did is we went out um, and talked to people, and I shouldn't say we, I should say our fabulous graduate students um, who uh, went to grocery stores, to libraries, to bus stops, to all the many wonderful, exciting festivals that we have in Dane County, um, and talked to folks and said, you know, what, what is holding your family back? What, what costs a lot? Um, what's hard for you to afford? Um, and you can see that some of the things that they talked about um, were things like childcare, racial discrimination, benefits, education. Um, so these are the things that, um, as we were brainstorming and putting together a proposal process, um, that, uh, that we were thinking about. So essentially, we put out a wide call, um, and we said, uh, we're going to have an ideation process. Uh, that's what Schmidt Futures has asked us to lead. So we'll put out an open call for ideas. Um, I had a, a public kickoff with organizations. We had a kickoff on campus with faculty, where we had over 100 faculty show up and, to learn about it. Um, and then throughout the summer, we held office hours, uh, both on campus and also at the UW um, South Madison Partnership uh, building over by uh, Urban uh, League. And uh, we talked with a lot of people from the community about ideas that they had, things that they were doing, um, and trying to create partnerships um, where there hadn't been or to foster existing partnerships to come up with ideas that would um, meet this challenge. So we got 47 proposals to start with um, at the end of August. We narrowed that down to 11 proposals. And then we narrowed it down to three. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our three finalists who will be traveling to Schmidt Futures, uh, or to Phoenix, to pitch their ideas in front of a board put together by Schmidt Futures in just two weeks. Um, so the first team is called Lift Dane, a uh, clever acronym there, uh, Legal Interventions for Transforming Dane. So this is a partnership between Legal Action of Wisconsin, uh, the UW Law School, and the Employment and Training Association of Dane County. And essentially, uh, what they're trying to do is use data and technology uh, to help people overcome their civil legal barriers. Um, they look at uh, things like expungement of um, corrections records, uh, not having a driver's license, having child support orders and arrears uh, that are too high, uh, that they can't pay, or arrears, um, and all sorts of different civil legal issues, but issues that they say are fixable, right? Like these are things that if you had a lawyer, um, you probably could get some help doing. Um, now, if you're very um, low income, you might have access to free legal aid, but there's a gap. There's you know, the, a group that are not eligible for free legal aid, but they're not uh, you know, well off enough to have a lawyer on retainer. Um, and this is um, trying to extend some of the services, for example, that legal action, you know, people that they work with, um, to that group. It's very clever. Um, it's, it's trying to come up with basically a, a 
legal checkup where we can use public data. You can look up, um, you know, kind of type in your information. Um, they can look up, use public data to say, okay, here are some of the things that we could help you with. Can we help make you an appointment with, um, you know, a lawyer? Or can we, you know, help point you to a, a different service here? So um, it has the opportunity, you know, to both uh, create employment, reduce barriers to employment, um, and also empower people to kind of do their do their own work and have access to the same kind of things that people with more money would have access to. Uh, the second group is called We Care for Dane Kids. Um, so this is a partnership with the Wisconsin Early Childhood Education. Er, Wisconsin Early Childhood Association, uh, Reach Dane, several faculty from UW, uh, the City of Madison, and Madison Out of School Time. Um, so this is a group that's really trying to help parents, um, but also help workers uh, in the childcare sector. So they look at the issue of childcare. Childcare is very costly, but also childcare workers are still very poorly paid. So there's a supply and a demand problem here. And so they have a four-pronged approach. One is trying to get businesses uh, to help uh, families who are interested in looking at dependent care accounts and taking advantage of that and trying to get more families to use that and get businesses potentially to um, help support those. Uh, trying to uh, get more families who are eligible for child care subsidies signed up for those subsidies. There's a very low take-up rate of those. And then um, on the worker side, uh, trying to help, uh, you know, most child care centers are actually small businesses. Um, and there are potential efficiencies that if they could work together, if they had a cooperative for some of their um, back office services or trying to buy supplies, um, trying to have substitutes for when people are sick or want to go on vacation. Um, so trying to bring a shared services network together that would help support those local businesses. Um, and also to help supplement uh, worker wages, because the bottom line is that most uh, child care providers, like I said, are very, very low paid. So it's, it's a four-piece puzzle that really tries to address it as the um, complicated system that it is. And then the third uh, finalist is called Earn Dane Digital Transformation Initiative. So this is a partnership with way too many groups for me to name all of them, but um, this is the, uh, as a consortium, you can kind of think of them as the Dane County Employment and Training Network. Um, so this is an amazing group of people and organizations that have worked together for a long time, but also trying to create some new partnerships um, with the university and with the private sector as well. Um, and essentially, so they've, they've had programs in the past of getting workers a job, so getting the unemployed employed. Now it's how do we move people up the ladder, so up the ladder into the middle class to their next job. What are the barriers, what are the mentoring and coaching um, and different kinds of professional development opportunities that they could have? And then how can we use technology to communicate with each other so that we're more efficient in provi providing services, so we can provide more services to more people, um, and so we can and help uh, the workers that we're working with, um, you know, they need to be able to use technology as well. So, and it's also using things like behavioral science where, you know, uh, workers are signing up for a training program. Um, they might get a text from a peer, um, you know, that little nudge like, oh, you know, you did great in class or don't forget to come to class tomorrow, you know, things like that. So, um, again, just a really exciting um, opportunity for Dane County. So this initiative, like I said, has taken IRP into sort of a new direction. Um, this is, we've, we have a long uh, standing um, role as a federal poverty center in working with state agencies. Um, and this has really given us an opportunity to go more local and we couldn't be more excited um, by what we're doing uh, with the community right now. So our long-term goals here are, again, you know, improving the lives of families, um, fostering and, and building new uh, infrastructure that helps to solve local problems, um, and really engaging researchers in this community work, and hopefully impressing Schmidt Futures so they want to continue to support 
um, our efforts in the future. And I should say that we are, like I said, we're at the, we've picked three finalists now who get to go pitch their idea. At least one of them, possibly two, will uh, move to the next round of competition. Uh, which means that in June uh, they will get to compete for a large bucket of capital funding. We don't have an exact dollar amount, but we're talking like a million or more. Um, so we're very, very excited about that. But we're also excited about the portfolio that we've built. So even all the ideas that don't get funded by Schmidt Futures, um, we're having a showcase in April um, for the community. So I'll, I'll put that up there in just a minute and would love for you to come. Um, we also are excited because there's a round two of this challenge. We don't know exactly what the challenge is yet. <laughs> we don't have the, the 10,000 by 10% 10 by 2020 exact numbers. We're still talking with Schmidt about that, but we should have that announcement in February. So I just want to end uh, the talk here, and I'm really excited to take your questions um, with just reminding you that you know poverty is one of our thorniest problems um, you know, that we have in uh, the United States and in Wisconsin, it takes efforts from everybody. Um, so we really welcome public engagement with IRP. Um, I hope that you're excited, as excited about Dream Up Wisconsin as I am, if you had never heard about it before. Um, I encourage you to visit our website and join our listserv, uh, where you will get lots of news. Definitely look for a press release after January 29th um, when we have our competition. Uh, also invite you to attend our community showcase on April 3rd, 2019. Um, so we're still finalizing details on that, but it'll be at Gordon Commons, um, in the, uh, which is on campus. Um, and there, uh, that'll be an opportunity for all of the 47 participants uh, who uh, put, to get, put forth proposals to share their ideas in some shape or form, and we'll also be uh, talking about the round two competition. Uh, please come to our seminars, help us spread the, work, uh, the word uh, um, by reading and sharing our publications, and you know, let us know how else we can work with you. Um, you know, one thing we've learned with Dream Up is that there's a lot of amazing work uh, going on in this community, so we're excited to hear about it as well. And with that, I'd love some questions. Yes, yeah, so the question was, um, we have three great ideas. We hope you know, one will get chosen to move further. What do we do with the portfolio, the, the rest of the ideas? Um, so uh, we are, are trying to work uh, with, so one concrete thing that we're going to do is have this showcase, which we're going to invite local funders uh, to, um, that we hope to do as much as we can to disseminate um, these ideas. We're continuing to work with, for example, the top 11 teams. So even um, beyond the top three, we're still um, you know, sharing feedback, trying to um, provide mentorship um, to continue. They got some funding. They got Each of those teams got $10,000 to help uh, move their idea forward. So um, we are definitely, they are not to be put on the shelf. Um, we're definitely trying to, to work with that. And that's one of the things we're pushing with Schmidt Futures as well, is saying, you know, we're really excited, and yes, we want that big pile of capital, but we, oh, yeah, we're most excited about the portfolio that's been developed, and we want to you know, keep working with uh, funders and leaders in the community because these are really good ideas. Um, and even if they can't be implemented exactly at the scale that Schmidt Futures was looking for, there are a lot of things that could, could be there. So um, that is as much a deliverable um, as the one idea is. Yes? I see lots of uh, concentration on the effects of poverty on children, mm -hmm. the effects of need for childcare in the middle, lower middle, lower class, you know, in the, in the range of people who have trouble paying for it. Mm -hmm. I don't see elder care. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who have, who are the, the pinched 
generation. They still have kids to take care of, but they also have aging, ailing family members to take care of. Mm -hmm. If they quit work to take care of those people, mm -hmm. they fall back down mm -hmm. in terms of income. Got a program for them too? <laughs> So the question was, um, we see a lot of emphasis on child care and, and difficulty in paying for child care. What about elder care or families who um, are pinched, you know, kind of in this uh, like sandwich generation, I think is what we use, right? So may have to quit their jobs to take care of elderly relatives. Um, where's the solution for them? Round two, I'm going to give you my card, and you're going to write me a proposal for that. I think it sounds amazing. I, th I think that's, you know, uh, yes, yes, yeah. You know, that, that is exactly the kind of idea. So we did not get a proposal like that this round, but I expect we will in round two. Um, uh, and one of the other schools I know did have, uh, has a proposal out there uh, where, it's trying to, I don't, I haven't read the full proposal, but just the summary of the idea was that having young people move in with um, elderly people who are trying to stay in their homes, for example. So, um, so I welcome solutions along that line. I think it's a really important issue. In the back. I wonder if you work with the county health rankings and if the atypicalness of Dane County is a hindrance to your studies? <laughs> If you were going to uh, take it to all the health county rankings across the country, how does uh, the Dane County's untypicalness uh, affect your studies? Thanks. So the question was, um, do you work with county health rankings and thinking about how Dane County is kind of a unique county? Is that a concern? Is it a limitation in this challenge? Um, so I think the answer the, to your question is yes and. Um, so yes, it is a limitation, and it is true that what works in Dane County may not work in Douglas County, may not work in Milwaukee County. Um, and you may ask, why was Dane County, you know, why is that even the catchment area? Um, so I don't know the exact full story behind that because I, I came into the project uh, kind of right when we were uh, finishing up the proposal. But my understanding is that, you know, yes, Dane County is unique, but it's also, um, it's got a lot of opportunities to be a testing ground, right? We have urban, we have rural, um, and one of the things about the Schmidt Futures Challenge, um, so it's definitely a challenge, it's about economics, it's about economic prosperity, but what we've learned over time is that it's also sort of a political science challenge. So what Schmidt Futures is really interested in is having universities and public entities help create change. So can these public entities make a difference? So the, you know, that town and gown relationship, they're really interested in that and, and how do we do that. So one of the arguments for having Dane County is, um, you know, it, it, it is atypical, but it has, you know, the very, very important and very, um, you know, right now intractable issue of these incredible disparities uh, by race. So that is something, you know, I think a challenge that's worth trying to do something about. Um, but it's also about having the university and, and trying to see, you know, how do you, how do you create that relationship. But yes, it, it can be limiting um, in terms of, you know, we don't expect that it's going to, what we find here will exactly um, you know, translate everywhere else. I think that's part of what makes um, being this challenge being an alliance interesting because there are other schools, and so you know that's something we can look at the, the variation in in what happens regionally, and hopefully we'll work together a little bit more to um, you know to address some things at more of the national level. And and I should say, county health rankings, um, we do work with public health quite a bit. So um, yeah, they they do some great work. Yes. Uh, what type of income are you talking about for the, for the middle class? I mean, some people are going to go up like four thousand. Most people think they're in the middle class anyway. How do, how do you interpret that? Yeah, the question was, how do you basically how do you define the middle class, right? Is it a, a number? Um, a, you know, if you ask people, most people will tell you they're in the middle class, which obviously is mathematically incorrect, right? So, um, 
we struggled with that question a lot. And we got, a, like I said, a lot of pushback from some of the first people we talked with, like, how are you going to talk about this? Um, so Schmidt, again, Schmidt Futures did not say we had to pick a particular income point, And we thought it was important not to um, in our community uh, because we were more interested in closing the disparities than maybe we were at getting a particular number. That said, if we're pushed and we have to think about it, um, you know, we could think about a number of about 40,000, um, you know, for, for family income. So how can we increase income by about $4,000? $4,000 is like a real um, sort of policy relevant number. So if you remember me talking about the baby's first years, um, you know, that's the amount of money that they um, are using in their experiment. That's if you look at things like the earned income tax credit and some other kind of public benefits, you know, that seems to be like a comfortable, um, you know, number for policymakers and, and something research-wise that seems to make an impact. So that's a number we had in the back of our heads. Um, but are we going to be sad if we raise people's incomes by ten thousand um, dollars? No. And you know, and if we're, you know, for some families it's a little bit lower and some a little bit higher. You know, that's okay. So they, they, the the funder has given us some some room to think about that. Yes. I'd like to talk about geography. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so the question was, um, we need. How do we think about um, poverty and income uh, potentially by geography, right? That that or by, ge neighborhood. by neighborhood. But also mm -hmm. concentrated. Right, because neighborhood. So we have a lot of scholars that um, in our network and at IRP who think about this a lot. So that's actually one of our thematic research networks is focused on poverty and geography. Um, as the topic, because I agree with you um, that geography, um, you know, where you live can mean a lot of things, right? It can mean access to higher or lower quality schools. It can mean um, who are your peers. It can mean who are your network um, when you're trying to get jobs. It can mean um, how safe are you from things like gun violence and um, and different, how's the quality of housing, right? So, um, so I think, so that is all to say poverty and geography are important. We got some proposals for, if you're asking about Dream Up specifically, um, oh, okay. <laughs> um, Mm -hmm. So I think um, those are some of the questions you know that we're exploring. As I and you know there are some kind of famous studies um, that some of our affiliates have worked on, um, like uh, move to opportunity, right? So you give people vouchers to move out of neighborhoods, and you know what happens. And um, those have been very interesting results, you know, for and and. I think the other, you know, the other thing is when you're studying poverty, you know, it's, it's really exciting to think that there could be an answer, right? And what we sort of forget about is that, the, you know, that not everyone who is poor is the same, right, or faces the same barriers. So I think there, you know, that's an example where that research shows like really good um, outcomes for some groups of people. Um, or you know, for maybe really young children, and less for teenagers, or less you know. Um, so there may be differences um, across age or across groups, um, and so that's an area of research where we continue to try to do <laughs> experiments and try to figure that out. You said you had a follow-up question. Oh, okay. I always get two questions. <laughs> I, 
the, the first question I have is, uh, how does the uh, IRP define poverty, specific in relation to, let's say, authoritative views or authoritarian <coughs> views? Hmm. So the question is, how does IRP define poverty in relation to authoritarian and authoritative views? Can you say a little more? I'm not... I, well, okay. so, I, so I guess the... the I guess the, the yeah. basic concept, what I'm, I'm looking at here is the difference between authoritative as being wealthy and authoritarian as being rich. You know, the difference of, ah. is it monetary is it just money? Yeah, yeah, or yeah. Is, are yeah. you looking at a much larger perspective yep. that initiates something that not just today, mm -hmm. but also has something tomorrow? Thank you for that clarification. So we have scholars who look at both of those questions um, and would take both of those views. That what, you know, how much money you have today matters a lot, but do you own a house? Do you have wealth um, that you can pass on to your children? Um, you know, that has intergenerational um, implications for poverty, right? So both. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, having more income today or right now can have an impact on development, um, but not having wealth can also put people at disadvantage. The second question I have is, is related to um, the Schmidt Futures. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 2016 to 2021. Is that a timeline or a deadline? <laughs> <laughs> um, the question was, uh, the Schmidt Futures, uh, it's 2016 to 2020, actually. I wish it was 2021. Um, <laughs> is that a, a, a deadline or a timeline? Um, so the way they set up the challenge is that they want to measure at, in December of 2020 and see if we've increased incomes by 10% for 10,000 people. So it's a deadline. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell me what the IRB or the IRP is like when you're doing these experiments mm -hmm. with Yep. So the question was, how do you get these kinds of studies through your institutional review board? Um, especially when you've got something like you're giving people money versus not giving people money. Um, so this is something I actually work with agencies. So first of all, we have an amazing staff member at the Institute for Research on Poverty um, named Maggie Townsend, whose primary job is working to with the Institutional Review Board and working with our researchers to make sure um, that we are doing due diligence, um, that we're following the rules, that we're doing uh, good for people and not harming people um, and that we're doing ethical research so she's amazing and and you know we're really one of the only institutes that has a person that and that's whose job <laughs> you know it is that's what she does all day long um, but this is something I you know I do work with when I was at the Department of Children and Families for example I worked um, with the home visiting program and we were trying to do a randomized controlled trial and that meant that we were going to be able to provide home visiting, which is having professionals um, you know, work with uh, families who are at you know, potential risk of uh, poor outcomes, to provide some services coming into the home, providing some educational services, connection to social services while mom is pregnant or right after the baby's born. Um, and those kinds of programs have generally shown very high quality programs. Um, have shown really positive outcomes. And, um, but there still are a lot of questions about, like, this is a complicated program. What pieces are most important? Who should deliver the services? Who should get the services? What exactly should the services be? Um, so the federal government um, had, had invested quite a bit of money and given to states to do these kinds of programs. Um, and we're trying to do a randomized controlled trial, which means that we're going to provide home visiting services to half of the families and you know not home visiting services something you know a bag of um, you know a box or a gift bag or box and and access to information about other local services right um, and you know I'd, I've worked with um, you know some of the home visitors were in tears because they're just like we can't we can't do that like how can you ask us to um, hold back services from families or how could you ask us to hold back money 
Um, and, and that's hard when you're doing research. And I think you know, the answer to that is it's just as unethical to be spending resources and money on things that don't really work or that don't really change outcomes than it is to withhold any service. Um, and sometimes something like randomized control trials are actually more fair than just letting people sign up and giving services to the first person who gets in line. Because the likelihood is the first person who gets in line probably is a little bit better off to start with than the person who didn't get in line at all, right? So you have to kind of work through that. Um, and certainly all of our studies go through the IRB and you know, we work with some really challenging populations, so people who are incarcerated, um, you know, non-custodial parents who are, think we're a sting operation. Um, you know, so we have to think about all those kinds of things. But ultimately the reason we do the research, if we're sure something works, we don't do research you know, about it. But if there are questions, we don't want to be wasting precious resources because the outcomes are too important.